Uh, all right, good morning. Welcome back to our study in Revelation. If you have your Bibles, uh, it's at the back. It's at the, at the back of the book. The, uh, just flip to the end and, and you're going to be pretty close to where we're at. We're in a study about um, Jesus and, and really the revealing of Jesus, which is what the book of Revelation I- is about. It's about the revelation of Jesus. Uh, to, 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 the, to the world and, and, and seeing how amazing he is, it, more amazing than, than his church, more amazing than, than the, the most overwhelming of evil that we will experience. We're going to see how amazing Jesus is. Now, last week we started looking at Jesus as he walks among and as he is among his imperfect churches. And it, we saw, okay, his church is imperfect, but Jesus is not. And, and yet he's still there. He's still among his churches and he has things to say to each church. He has things, uh, words of encouragement encouragement that he wants to give and words of correction that that he wants to give as well if we want to be a church that follows God well and we do if we want to be a church that follows God well and and one that's changing to be more and more like Jesus then we need to be aggressive at learning how to hear from Jesus how to how to hear as a church what Jesus wants to say to us as a, a church, the good and the bad. If, if you, um, maybe you're new here or you haven't been around for a while, it, it, we have this thing called pre-service prayer. And, and it's probably one of the most significant things that, that we do. It, we gather before each, each service, so um, Belfast and Southside, for uh, soon to be five different gatherings where we gather together and we just, as a church, seek God. We seek God to inter- intervene in our gatherings. We seek God to, to intervene in our city and our nation. And we, spe- we seek God to, to, to speak. Jesus, what do you want to say to us as a church? What do you want to say to us as a people? That is straight from Revelation 2 and 3 where we're studying right now. That, that, that's one of the big whys between, behind our pre-service prayer time is we believe as a church we want to hear what Jesus wants to say to us and so we want to set aside time and call each other to Together to pray, to seek, and to listen. If, if you used to come to pre-service prayer uh, and, and you, you kind of like, ah, I did that for a while, uh, I want to invite you back to it. It's, it's a, one of the biggest things that we do, one of the biggest, most important things that, that we do um, where we, we seek God and we set to listen. What does the Spirit want to say to us, to us as, as a church? Jesus has things to encourage us with, and we want to hear those. He has things that he wants to redirect, and we want to hear those. It's, it's, it's the kind of church that we want to be. So uh, I encourage you, uh, if you're new here or visiting, pre-service prayer, an hour before the gatherings, and, and, and come along and, and seek Jesus with us. Uh, so that's, that's just a free invite. Oh, and, and we don't charge for that, so you can just come and, and join us in, in seeking Jesus together. He's a big deal. Anyway, so last week, we started looking at the first three of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Uh, Today, we're going to finish the last four in uh, chapter, end of chapter two, beginning in chapter three. So the, the recap from last week, the first three churches is, the first church we looked at was a church in Ephesus. And that church was a pretty great church, except for it had abandoned the love that it had at first. And so the question that we asked ourselves as a church and as individuals is, well, two questions. How is our love for Jesus right now? Have we fallen into apathy or feeling dry and distant? Or how is our love for people, for imperfect people, which is people, imperfect people? uh, Are we being critical? Are we being annoyed? So we started looking at Ephesus and and asking those questions in in reflection because Jesus keeps saying, listen to what the Spirit is saying to his churches. Churches. So we're listening. The next church we looked at was Smyrna, and that church was brutally persecuted, just brutally persecuted, and Jesus basically tells them to to keep going. He's put an end 10 days, which isn't 10 days, but it's 10 days, but it isn't, but it is, but it isn't, but it is. It's 10 days, and there's an end in sight, and then the persecution's gonna stop, and just hold on until you die. That's Jesus' message to this church. And so we asked ourselves, if that sounds dark, there's a lot of places in the world right now where it's this dark, where it's this dark. After looking at the church in Smyrna, we asked ourselves, how is our commitment to Jesus through every test and every affliction? Are we determined to be faithful to Jesus no matter what? Faithful even to the point of death. So that's the, the second church. 
The third church that we looked at last week was Pergamum. Uh, Pergamum, and, and although it was really great at withstanding persecution, it, it was mighty against persecution, this extremely mighty church had, had crumbled on the inside, and so even though they were good against persecution, they turned towards sexual immorality, the teaching of Balaam, idol worship, and so they crumbled. And so we asked ourselves last week in light of Pergamum, how is our priority of purity going? Our priority of purity, our practice of living holy in an unholy city. Like, how are we doing in that area? Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Again, as I said before, every church needs to be able to hear what Jesus is saying to it. Every church needs to grow in that. We need to have the humility to hear and receive the encouragements and the humility to hear and receive the corrections. Now, now we're going to pick up um, with these, these next four churches, and we're going we're to ask ourselves some more questions, reflective questions on, on how are we doing as a church and how are we doing as individuals, because Jesus is speaking to churches, and you can easily see in different churches some people are struggling with things that others aren't, and vice versa. So, so we're going to look at this all together. Now, there's four letters left. The first one, the next one here, is to Thyatira. And it's the longest and most difficult of the letters, and it's addressed to the least known, least important, least remarkable of the seven cities. Uh, the first three letters that we looked at kind of form a little bit of a triad. The last three letters are going to form a little bit of a triad of letters. And then this middle one is longer, and, and it's... It's just, it's, it serves like a hinge between these, these two groups of, of three. So Thyatira, let's talk about Thyatira. Thyatira, it's in a big valley. It's, a, it's in a big valley. There's, there's poor defenses. It's, it's the most easily takeoverable of the cities. And so anytime an invaders would come in or a different group would come in, it would just be surrender and it would just it would just switch hands uh, just just very easily um every every time there is um yeah there was changes in in politics or religion we just switch switch to whatever is necessary they couldn't fight for themselves so spiritually speaking um religiously speaking not very significant politically speaking not very significant uh, but it did have pretty good manufacturing and commerce we know somebody from there from acts chapter 16 her name was lydia she was living in philippi at the time she became a follower of jesus she made things purple clothes purple so she was from Th thyatira uh, let's look and see what Jesus says to this church. Again, the longest of the, the seven letters here, uh, starting in Revelation 2, picking up in verse 18. Write to the angel of the church in Thyatira, the Son of God, the one whose eyes are like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine bronze, says... Oh Amen. we're ready to listen, right? The Son of God says... The, the, the fiery eyed Jesus. I know your works, your love, faithfulness, service, and endurance. Your last works are greater than the first. You are improved. You're getting better and better, but this I have against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and, and teaches and deceives my slaves to commit sexual immorality and to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I will throw her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her practices. I will kill her children with the plague. Then all the churches will know that I am the one who examines minds and hearts. And I will give to each of you according to your works. I say to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who, have, who haven't known the deep things of Satan, as they say, I do not put any other burden on you, but hold on to what you have until I come. The one who is victorious and keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter and he will shatter them like pottery. I almost said poetry. It's totally different. Pottery. 
Just as I have received this from my Father, I will also give him the morning star. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, again, Revelation 1, Jesus. Son of God, fire eyes. I see, every, I see and perceive everything that's going on. Uh, mighty Jesus, feet like burnished bronze. I'm coming in, in power, the power to act. Now, this church in Thyatira, it, it's, it's, a, it's amazing when it comes to the thing. If you're going to describe, okay, four attributes or five attributes that you want your church to be like, okay, how about we want to be good at love, loving people, loving God. We want to be good at love, okay. We want to be good at faithfulness. We want to be a faithful people. We want to be good at enduring uh, things. We want to be good at serving, and we want to always be getting better. That's, that's Thyatira. It's like, wow, okay, this is, a, this is an amazing church. That I, I would love to be described that way. But there's one thing that is holding against it. There's a huge problem in this church. Jezebel. Jezebel. Someone in the church who's a teacher, a prophetess, who is deceiving many in the church. We heard about a, a Balaam-like teacher previous. Now we've got this Jezebel in this church leading this church into sexual immorality and worship of false gods. This church has been great at love, which the Ephesian church wasn't, but terrible at discernment. It's, it's the naive church. It's this church that, that loves, but, it, but it is, it's naive. It's terrible at discernment. It's tolerating anything in the name of love, right? You know, in the name of, you know, like, that's uh, you too for everybody who's, who's uh, not my age. Anyways, so is it you too? Now that I'm, I'm choking, it is, right? Please, thank you. Bono, I'm with you. I, I hear you. I, I, I got it. Uh, as people, uh, the, so it's a naive church. It's bad at discernment. Jesus' people are called to be loving and paying attention and shrewd and discerning. Paul is urging his churches to, to not just roll with whatever, uh, to love, but also to be, to be, be uh, caring about truth. Jezebel is our Old Testament reference. She is one of the more evil uh, people in the Bible. She's this evil woman who is uh, Ahab's wife in 1 Kings and 2 Kings. She's, yeah, basically her, the characteristics of Jezebel is she's super spiritual. Like, she is undeniably spiritual. She's got 800 or 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Like she's, she's just so spiritual. She's like the spiritual giant of the nation. Uh, and yet, her spirituality isn't connected with what does God want, what is the, what about the Bible, you know, like, it's, it's not connected to that. It's a, it's a, it looks so spiritual, oozes spirituality. The other thing about uh, Jezebel is she champions sexual immorality and, and corrupting people in, in the area of purity. Another attribute of, of her is she's obsessed with power and control, either through manipulation or fear. She is, she's, tr she, she, oh, you're, my husband wants a, wants a vineyard? Okay, I'll just, I'll just sow these lies and, and deceit and, and put, in Naboth will be killed and, and, and my husband will get what he wants. Or I'll be so fear and terrifying that the prophet Elijah is gonna just tear, just run away from the nation even though he slaughtered all of my prophets. Like, I, I, I'm just going to, I'm going to exude power. I'm going to try and lead this nation under, with my weak husband, and I'm going to turn it away from the God of the Bible. Before this moment, before Jezebel, you had, um, okay, you had like David and, and Solomon, and they worshiped they had the temple of Jerusalem, uh, temple of God in Jerusalem, and then the kingdom divided. And when the kingdom divided, Jeroboam in the north, he, he set up a, corrupted version of worshiping the God of the Bible by putting a golden calf in the north and the south, but his claim was these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. Not, this is, it's a corrupted worship, but it's not like a totally different religion. Jezebel comes along and says, okay, it's going to be Baal. It's going to be Asherah and starts just bringing them just totally shamefully all the way away from, from the God of the Bible. So she pulls influential people she, uh, into her webs of deceit. She deceives people. She's, got, she's charming and, and manipulative and, and controlling. And, and unless you're discerning, it's easy to be swept away by this, by this, by this prophetess, by this, by this person. But strong leadership. That was true in the days of Ahab. It's true in the days of the, the church. 
Jezebel's trying to take over churches like what we're seeing in Thyatira, uh, turning people against leadership, undermining leadership, uh, uh, especially leaders who aren't going to follow what she thinks should be done. Now, she could be a guy or a girl, which is confusing, but it's okay. We live in a confused generation when it comes to that. Uh, promoting, promoting ungodly, uh, ungodly practices. Jesus says to this church that's struggling with this Jezebel, is I've given her time, but now I'm showing up. I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. I see. My, I'm the fiery-eyed Jesus. I see what's happening. I want you to be fiery-eyed people. I want you to see and discern what, what's, what's going on. There's major discipline coming against Jezebel. Praise God. Major I'm, I'm going to come against Jezebel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come against those who, are, who have been swept away from her teachings and her practices. I'm going to come against them. We're talking sickbed. We're talking about plague. We're talking about just just throwing down the work of Jezebel in this church. Jesus just reveals himself to be mighty to his church. He is not gonna tolerate this stuff in his church. Naive love without discernment can ruin a church, can ruin a family. We're called to love and discern. We're called to stand on the teaching of the Bible, just not the most, uh, not the most like, persuasive communicator on the planet. We're supposed to be, be uh, focused on what does the Bible say, not, not what, did, what teaching do we love to hear today. Jesus says to those who are innocent, hold on to what you have. The question I have for us based on the letter to Thyatira is, how are you at discerning and speaking truth and love? Are, 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 you, are we too tolerant of a church you know, whatever, whatever, you know, we, we just want you to know that you're loved and you're safe here. And sure, you can say whatever you want. Or are we saying, okay, yes, we love you. We care about you. But this is actually what the Bible says. In love, in truth. Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Unconfrontational love isn't real love. The fifth church is Sardis. Sardis, and that's a city with a golden past. It was uh, connected with the Midas legends, uh, the Midas, uh, golden Midas legend. They had this super rich king named Croesus, and, and the thing about Sardis as a city was it, was, it had cliffs on three sides. It was this mighty, it, it just thought of itself as this mighty, undefeatable um, fortress or just city, the cliffs on three sides, and, and, it, and it fell to the Persians in only 14 days. It was easily taken over. Why? Because they didn't even worry about guarding the, the three sides of the, the cliffs, and the Persians just climbed the walls and climbed the cliffs. Man, hello, 14 days, thank you. Uh, that, was, that was it. It perceived itself as strong, but actually it was entirely weak. This is what Jesus, Jesus writes to this church in Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. Write to the angel of the church in Sardis. The one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says... I know your works. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Be alert and strengthen what remains and, and what is about to die, for I have not found your works complete before my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. But if you're not alert, I will come like a thief, and you have no idea at what hour I will come against you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not defiled their clothes, and they will walk with me in white because they are worthy. In the same way, the victor will, will be dressed in, in white clothes, and I will never erase his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and before his angels. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so Jesus reveals himself as, as the one with the Holy Spirit that the sevenfold spirit or the seven, seven spirits uh, of God and the seven stars. This church has the reputation of being alive but isn't. It's the sleeping church. It's a church that needs to be reawakened. It, you, you think that you're doing great but actually you're spiritually asleep. You're spiritually asleep and you need to wake up. There's, there's nothing challenging this church. There's not a persecution mentioned. There's not a false teaching mentioned in this. There, there's, not, there's not any immorality mentioned. It's just a church that's just kind of sleeping. 
It's just, it's, it just needs to be reawakened. It's inactive. And Jesus is like, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come against you like a boss, like a, like a thief. Like I'm going to come against you like a thief, and, and you're not going to even see what, what's going to happen here. So this, this church is in drastic need of reawakening. Their heart's getting back to having fire for God, rekindling the passion for God. The question for us connected to the church in Sardis is this. Are you spiritually sleeping and need to be reawakened? When you look at your heart and your soul, are you, are, is it alive? Is it, is it growing? Is it thriving? Or, or, is it, or does it feel like you're, you're sleeping? Now, I'm not going to publicly announce this, so this isn't considered public. I'm not publicly announcing this for, uh, for, a few, well, for a few more days until at least I get three episodes done. But I've started a podcast on iTunes called Reawakening reawakening because the heart of this church and the heart of so much of what we want to do here is we want to help people be awake in their faith alive in in their faith and move from wherever they're at to towards feeling fresh towards god and it's so easy in life to have ups and downs and and i don't know where where you're at and what season you're at but but the aim of that podcast and the aim of just this church is to help people stay alive and not like the sardis church but stay awake to god now, again, I'll, I'll announce it when I get the third episode done on Instaland or something like that. But if you're here and you're like, I, I can't wait until this third episode, I want to start working on my heart now. One of the things you could do is you could just go on iTunes, Brian Ingram, if you can spell it, extra bonus points, uh, and, or Reawakening, and, and you'll, you'll find that podcast. Or if you know people who are feeling str- like they're struggling, you can, you can tell them about it. Re- hearts that are reawakened to God are a big deal to Jesus, they're a big deal to us. It's one of the big works that we're trying to do here. Um, Sardis, are you spiritually sleeping and need to be reawakened? Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That's the, that's the second to today, fifth total. The sixth church is the church in Philadelphia. Uh, not the one with the bell with the crack in it, a different Philadelphia. Philadelphia in AD 17, so a couple decades before this letter is written, uh, many decades actually, uh, had this huge earthquake followed by years of huge destructive aftershocks. It was, it was brutal. And so the economy in Philadelphia is just shattered. It, it was so weak, this, the economy, economy in the city. It, the government had to step in and, and help them out loads. This is what Jesus writes to the church in Philadelphia in verse 7. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close and closes and no one opens, says, I know your works. Because you have limited strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name, look, I have placed before you an open door that no one is able to close. Take note. I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, note this, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. That is quite a reversal from, I can't remember what it is, Isaiah something, I think it's Isaiah, where God talks about how the nations will come and say, yeah, acknowledge that their God is the right God. Uh, it's, It's a reversal of that Old Testament moment. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The victor, I will make him a pillar. Again, this is the weak church. I will make the victor a pillar in the sanctuary of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Anyone who has an ear should listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay. So the true one, Jesus, the true one, the holy one, the one who has the keys, he opens, he closes, he does what he wants. This church, again, it's the, it's the very weak church. Smyrna, which we looked at a few weeks ago, or last week, was poor. They were poor, and they were just to hold on until they, they, were, to, uh, they were to be killed. This is the other church that isn't, isn't rebuked for anything. It's, it's, it's persecuted by the Jews again, and, and, and it's weak. And basically, Jesus says, whatever strength you have, 
just hold on. Just, just, just hold on. And, and Jesus is like, I, I, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming, and I'm, I'm gonna help you. I know that you're weak. Now, I know that just a little bit disconnected from this, but a lot of, a lot of times you, you might find yourself in moments where you just feel worn out, where you feel weak, spiritual weak, empty. Maybe you've had times where you try, you're like, I'm, I need to pray today. I, I'm so dead, I've got nothing. I don't have a prayer in my head. I don't even have a clear thought in my head. I'm exhausted, I'm weak, I'm worn out. And, and you can hardly come up with the words, Jesus, help me. There's times like that. Jesus sees those moments, and, and he's paying attention. And he sees that his church here in Philadelphia is like that. They're weak, and he's just like, hold on, guys. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to come rescue you, those who are out of strength. Paul learned about this himself, where he was able to write in 2 Corinthians 12, Jesus' power is made perfect in, in our weaknesses. And I know we live in an era, every generation lives in an era where strength is admired. And yet Jesus is close to those who are out of it. The question we ask ourselves connected to the church in Philadelphia is, in whatever your strains, will you keep holding on to Jesus as you wait for his help? Will you keep holding on to Jesus as you wait for his help? And some of you, that's, that's what you need to hear today. You're like, I, I'm out of strength. I, I can't, I, I'm having a hard time holding on. I'm having a hard time even sitting through this message. It's so hot in here. Jesus, give me strength. He will. Bless that. In Jesus' name. The uh, seventh church, is, the final church, for the final church in, in this is Laodicea. And it's famous for having this medical college that worked with eyes and, and developing an eye salve. And it, and it had this robust economy. And then there was the lukewarm water thing, which we get to hear about. It's an affluent city. It's, it, it, has, it has covered walkways. It has heated walkways. Uh, it has heated walkways. I mean, wow, that's better than Glasgow. Rich, self, self-sufficient, self-sufficient. This is what Jesus says to the church in Laodicea. He says, write to the angel of the church in Laodicea, the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. Creation, creation. What a title. Like, Jesus is dropping it, right? He's like, just just want you all to know, like, I'll just throw out some random things about me. I'm the originator of God's creation. I'm I'm writing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we kind of underplay Jesus, you know? He's, he's, he's making it clear. I'm, the, I'm gonna say it again. The originator of God's creation. He, that's, I'm saying this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich. I have become wealthy and need nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. White clothes so that you may be dressed and your shameful nakedness not not be exposed. An ointment to spread on your eyes so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline so be committed and repent listen i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and have dinner with him and he with me the victor i will give him the right to sit with me on my throne just as i also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne anyone who has an ear should listen to what the spirit says to the churches jesus has nothing positive to say about this church. He has nothing, pos- it, it, nothing positive to say. They're lukewarm. They, they're rich. And they, they don't need anything else. They, they're self-sufficient. As, as a church, they're, they're self-sufficient. And Jesus is like, you, you think you're doing amazing, but you, you need to come to me for stuff. You need to come to me to buy some stuff. You think you have all you need because you can take care of yourself, but... You're actually wretched because you're not coming to me for stuff. You're just taking care of it on your own. Now, they obviously don't think of themselves as as wretched and poor. 
They think of themselves as having it all together. I'm, we're being responsible. We're being reliable. We don't need to ask Jesus for any help because we've got this figured out. If we have a need, maybe we'll ask him, but we don't need to do that. And as a result of being in a, in a habit of spirituality that doesn't ask Jesus for help because you're just gonna take care of it yourself, it, it stunts. It causes a wretched, unfaith-filled um, spirituality. The big danger for the self-sufficient church, the rich church, is, is the absence of felt need. There's no felt need. There's no desperation. And the, the lack of desperation leads to lazy, passionless walking with Jesus. It's in the seasons of desperation, of strain, when, you're, when, you're, when you're, you can't figure out how things are going to come together. When, when you're, there's poverty, when you don't know where your next meal is going to come from, when, when there's felt need and, and desperation and things are falling, it, that's when the passion starts to come to life. That's when the desperation starts to happen. That's when you learn how to pray. And you start praying your guts out, God, I need you to be to me who you are. I need you to intervene in my life. If you don't do something, I don't have a backup plan. I have nothing. I am throwing all of my my life, all of my hope, all of my trust on you. If you don't have aspects of that in your life, you never get that desperate. And so then your, your maturity pace goes through the floor. But when you're able to be in those places where you can see, God, I need you. I have no plan B. Provide. Then, then God then God um, teaches you that he is, he is who the Bible says he is. That, that he can be trusted. And we can grow in maturity. The, the affluent church, the self-sufficient church is, is naturally underdeveloped, mal, malnourished as a church. And yet it thinks it's great because it's being responsible and taking care of its church, itself. Jesus, why don't you go take care of those other churches who have problems? We've got ourselves sorted. We got ourselves sorted. I mean, uh, we, we're kind of that kind of church. I mean, I, 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 I consider myself rich. I have a pair of blue jeans. And because... Uh, I'm super cool. I've got a pair of black jeans because that's the definition of super cool. And then I've got these, which kind of, I don't know what these are. So, I, I, you know, I, I, multiple pairs of dress. I don't have to, like, wake up in the morning like, Jesus, I need to go teach in front of people. Please give me something for their benefit, like, to, to wear. And, and I can see that we're kind of in the same place. Thank, thank you. Uh, that somehow you found something to put on today to get, to get here, and, and, and everybody appreciates that. Like, there, God has provided. He's provided more than I need, more than, more than you need. And yet the danger that we we run into is um, are we even asking Jesus to provide or are we just asking for things that we can provide for ourselves are we are we walking in a faith that is beyond what we can that we can do ourselves see the self-sufficient church doesn't ask for things beyond itself the self-sufficient person doesn't believe things that it can't come up with itself will really happen and so the prayer requests are limited and the ministry is limited and everything just becomes, God did what I could do myself, as opposed to above and beyond what I could ask or imagine. Jesus disciplines the passionless church. He's, he's, he's nauseated by the one that just wants to take care of itself, that's, that's, that's faithful, but has no fire. It's, it's, it shows up, but it has no, no faith. No, no, no trust, no risky, no risky, no, 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 no zeal, no, no fire for God. Do what we can't do. The question for the church in Laodicea is, are you zealous for Jesus no matter the cost? Are you zealous for Jesus no matter the cost? Jesus is asking these questions to his churches. And so by the way of, of the challenges this week, um, we're going to put all four of the questions on, on the screen here. And, and like we did last week, I want you to pick one. What is a question that Jesus is agitating on your heart? Something for you to be uh, growing in and, and developing in this week. Are you someone who needs to be, okay, repent about Jesus? I have not been discerning. Uh, and, and I've not been speaking truth in love. I, I've, just been, I've just been too chill about that. I valued love or I valued truth, but I haven't had them both together. Or maybe spiritually sleep, sleeping and I need to reawaken. 
Or fourth, thirdly, whatever your strain, holding on, if you're in a time of weakness, I, I, need, I need, God, I need your strength, I need your, I need your help. Or are you feeling zealous for Jesus? Or, or, or God, God, I need you to reawaken my zeal for you, no matter the cost. I've been self-sufficient. My prayers have been too low, and my faith has been too low. 